Ai Lau, the forest eater. When Pele came to the island of Hawaii, seeking a permanent home, she found another god of fire, already in possession of the territory. Ai means the one who eats or devours. Laau means tree or a forest. Ai Laau was, therefore, the fire god who devours forests. Time and again, he laid the districts of South Hawaii desolate by the lava he poured out from his fire pits. He was the god with the insatiable appetite, the continual eater of trees, whose path through forests was covered with black smoke fragrant with burning wood, and sometimes burdened with the smell of human flesh charred into cinders in the lava flow. Ai Laau seemed to be destructive and was so named by the people, but his fires were a part of the forces of creation. He built up the islands for future life. The process of creation demanded volcanic activity. The flowing lava made land. The lava disintegrating made earth deposits and soil. Upon this land, storms fell, and through it, multitudes of streams found their way to the sea. Flowing rivers came from the cloud-capped mountains. Fruitful fields and homes made this miniature world building complete. Ai Laau still poured out his fire. It spread over the fertile fields, and the people feared him as the destroyer, giving no thought to the final good. He lived, the legends say, for a long time in a very ancient part of Kilaui on the large island of Hawaii, now separated by a narrow ledge from the great crater and called Kilaui Iki, little Kaliaui. This seems to be the first and greatest of a number of craters extending in a line from the Great Lake of Fire in Kilauai to the seacoast many miles away. They are called the pit craters because they are not hills of lava, but a series of pits going deep down into the earth, some of them still having blowholes of sputtering steam and smoke. After a time, Ai Laau left these pit craters and went into the great crater. He was said to be living there when Pele came to the seashore far below. In one of the Pele stories is the following literal translation of the account of her taking Kilauea. When Pele came to the island of Hawaii, she first stopped at a place called Kia Hialaka in the district of Puna. From this place, she began her inland journey toward the mountains. As she passed on her way, there grew within her an intense desire to go at once and see Ailaau, the god to whom Kilaui belonged, and find a resting place with him at the end of her journey. She came up, but Ailaau was not in his house. Of a truth, he had made himself thoroughly lost. He had vanished because he knew that this one coming toward him was Pele. He had seen her toiling down by the sea at Kiahayalaka. Trembling dread and heavy fear overpowered him. He ran away and was entirely lost. When Pele came to that pit, she laid out the plan for her abiding home beginning at once to dig up the foundations. She dug day and night and found that this place fulfilled all her desires. Therefore, she fastened herself tight to Hawaii for all time. These are the words in which the legend disposes of this ancient god of volcanic fires. He disappears from Hawaiian thought, and Pele, from a foreign land, finds a satisfactory crater in which her spirit power can always dig up everlastingly. How Pele came to Hawaii. The simplest, most beautiful legend does not mention the land from which Pele started. In this legend, her father was Moi Moia Auli, the chief who dreamed of trouble. Her mother was Haumia, or Papa, who personified Mother Earth. 
Moi Moia apparently is not mentioned in any other of the legends. Haumia is frequently named as the mother of Pele, as well as the heroine of many legendary experiences. Pele's story is that of wonderlust. She was living in a happy home in the presence of her parents, and yet for a long time she was stirred by thoughts of faraway lands. At last she asked her father to send her away. This request meant that he must provide a seagoing canoe with matte sails, sufficiently large to carry a number of persons and food for many days. What will you do with your little egg, sister? asked her father. Pele caught the egg, wrapped it in her skirt to keep it warm near her body, and said that it should always be with her. Evidently, in a very short time, the egg was changed into a beautiful little girl for the name of Hai Aka I ka poli o Pele. Hai Aka in the bosom of Pele, the youngest one of the Pele family. After the care of the helpless one had been provided for, Pele was sent to her oldest brother, Kamo Hoalei, the king of dragons, or as he was later known in Hawaiian mythology, the god of sharks. He was a sea god who would provide the great canoe for the journey. While he was getting all things ready, he asked Pele where she was going. She replied, I am going to Bola Bola, to Kwai Hilani, to Kanihuna Moku, then to Moku Manamana, then to see a queen, Keo Ahi, her name, and Nii Hau, her island. Apparently, her journey would be first to Bora Bora and the Society Islands then among the mysterious ancestral lands, and then to the northwest until she found Niihau, the most northerly of the Hawaiian group. The god of sharks prepared his large canoe and put it in the care of some of their relatives. Kani Pua Hio Hio, Kani the whirlwind, Ki Aumiki, the strong current, and Ki Auka, moving seas. Pele was carried from land to land by these wise boatmen until at last she landed on the island of Niihau. Then she sent back the boat to her brother, the shark god. It is said that after a time he brought all the brothers and sisters to Hawaii. Pele was welcomed and entertained. Soon she went over to Kauai the large, beautiful garden island of the Hawaiian group. There is a story of her appearance as a dream maiden before the, before the king of Kauai, whose name was Lohaiau. She married him, but could not stay until she had found a place where she could build a permanent home for herself and all who belonged to her. She had a magic digging tool called Paoa, when she struck this down into the earth, it made a fire pit. It was with this paua that she was to build a home for herself and Lohio. She dug along the lowlands of Kauai, but water drowned the fires she kindled. She went from island to island, but could only dig along the beach near the sea. All her fire pits were so near the water that they burst out in great explosions of steam and sand and quickly died until at last she found Kilauai on the larger island of Hawaii. There she built a mighty, enduring place of fire, but her dream marriage was at an end. The little sister, Haiaka, after many adventures, married Lohaiau and lived on Kauai. Again and again, the legends give Kuwa Heilo as the father and Haumia as the mother of the Pele family. Hina is sometimes said to be Kuwa Heilo's sister in these legends. She quarreled with him because he devoured all the people. The Hawaiians, as a nation, 
even in their traditions, have never been cannibals, although their legends give many individual instances of cannibalism. The Pele stories say that Kuahailo was a cannibal and Haumia was a Pele precipice or a prominent part of the earth. The a greater sorcerer married Namakoa Kahai, Pele's sister, who was goddess of the sea. After a time, he saw Pele and her beautiful young sister, Haiaka. He took them secretly to be his wives. This sorcerer was Aukele Nui A Iku, the great smoothly swimming son of Iku. He could fly through the heavens, swim through the seas, or run swiftly over the earth. By magic power, he conquered enemies, visited strange lands, found the fountain of the water of life, sprinkled that water over his dead brothers, brought them back to life, and did many marvelous deeds. But he could not deliver Pele and Haiaka from the wrath of their sister. High tides and floods from the seas destroyed Pele's home and lands. Then the elder brother of Pele, <clears throat> Kamo Hoali'i, the shark god, called for all the family to aid Pele. Namakoa Kahai fought the whole family and defeated them. <clears throat> she broke down their houses and drove them into the ocean. There, Kamahoa Li'i provided them with the great boat, Honua Iakia, the great spread out world, and carried them away to distant islands. Namakoa Kahahi, <clears throat> Namakaoa Kahai went to the highest of all the mythical lands of the ancestors, Nu Mialani the raised dais of heaven. There she could look over all the seas from Kalaki Nui Akane to Kauai, from a legendary land in the south to the most northerly part of the Hawaiian islands. Pele carried her paua, the magic spade. Wherever they landed, she struck the earth, thus opening a crater in which volcanic fires burned. As the smoke rose to the clouds, the angry, the angry watching one rushed from Nua Mialani and tried to slay the family. Again and again they escaped, farther and farther from the homeland were they driven until they struck far out into the ocean. Namakawa Kahai went back to her lookout mountain. After a long time, she saw the smoke of earth fires far away on the island of Kauai. Pele had struck her paawa into the earth, dug a deep pit, and thrown up a large hill known to this day as the Pu o Pele, the hill of Pele. It seemed as if an abiding place had been found. But the sister came and fought Pele. There is no long account of the battle. Pele was broken and smashed and left for dead. She was not dead, but she left Kauai and went to Oahu, to a place near Honolulu, to Moana Loa, a beautiful suburb. There she dug a fire pit. The earth, or rather the eruption of lava, was forced up into a hill which later bore the name of Ki Alia Manu, the bird, the bird white like a salt bed, or the white bird. The crater which she dug filled up with salt water and was named Ki Aliapa Kai, the white bed of salt or salt lake. Pele was not able to strike her paoa down into a mountainside and dig deep for the foundations of her home. She could find fire only in the lowlands near the seashore. The best place on Oahu was just back of Lehi, the ancient Hawaiian name for Diamond Head. Here she threw up a great quantity of fire rock, but at last her fires were drowned by the water and she struck below. Thus she passed along the coast of each island, the family watching and aiding until they came to the great volcano of Haleakala. <clears throat> Haleakala. 
There Pele dug with her paoa, and a great quantity of lava was thrown out of her fire pit. Nama Kaoi Kahai saw enduring clouds day after day, rising with the colors of the dark, dense smoke of the underworld, and knew that her sister was still living. Pele had gained strength and confidence. Therefore, she entered alone into a conflict unto death. The battle was fought by the two sisters hand to hand. The conflict lasted for a long time along the western slope of the mountain Halikala. Namakoakahai tore the body of Pele, broke her lava bones into great pieces, which lie to this day along the seacoast of the district called Kahikinui. The masses of broken lava are called na iwi o Pele, the bones of Pele. Pele and the Owl Ghost God. Many, many years after Pele's angry sister, Nama Kaoa Kahai, had driven her from the island of Kauai, and after the land had many dwellers therein, a quarrel arose between two of the highest chiefs of the island. They were named Koa and Kau. It did not become an open conflict immediately, but Koa was filled with such deep hatred that he was ready to employ any means to destroy his enemy. There was a mighty Kapua or dragon of the Pi family at, the, at that time on Kauai. These dragons had come, according to the legends, to the Hawaiian islands from the faraway lands of Kaihilani as attendants on the first young chief Kahanei Kaakua, the boy brought up by the gods. These dragons had the mana or magic power of appearing as men or as dragons according to their desire. This dragon was named Pi'i Kalalau, Pili dwelling at Kalalau. He was supposed to be semi-divine. His home was on the crest of an almost inaccessible precipice up which he would rush with incredible speed. Koa, the angry chief, came to this precipice and called Pi'i to come to him. There, they plotted the death of Ka'u, the enemy. Assuming the appearance of a splendidly formed young man, Hai'i went down among the people with Koa to watch for an opportunity to seize Ka'u. After a time, Ka'u was lured to go at night to a house far from his own home. As he entered the door, he received a heavy blow that smashed the bones of one shoulder and laid him prostrate. A great giant leaped out, thrusting an enormous spear at him. Ka'u was one of the most skillful of all chiefs in what was known as spear practice. He avoided the thrusts and leaped to his feet. He had a wooden dagger as his only weapon, but could not get near enough to the giant to use it. Just as he was becoming too weary to move, his wife, who had followed him, hurled rocks, striking the giant's face. Then, seizing her husband, she fled with him homeward. There followed a great battle in which P.E. attacked all the warriors belonging to the wounded chief. The legends say that this giant was 12 feet high. He had eyes as large as a man's fist and an immense mouth full of tusks like those of a wild hog. His legs were as large as trees, and his weight was such that wherever he stepped, there were great holes in the ground. The warriors fled as this mighty giant charged upon them. Suddenly, they stopped and rushed back. Their chief's wife had caught an ikoi, a heavy piece of wood fastened to a long, stout cord. This she hurled so that it twisted around him and bound his arms to his sides. Stones and spears beat upon him, but he broke the coconut fiber cords of the ikoi and again drove the warriors before him, trying to gain the house where the wounded chief Kau was lying. There was an old prophetess 
who had rushed to the side of her master when he was brought to his home. She was one of the worshippers of Pele, the fire goddess of the island of Hawaii. Powerful were her prayers and incantations. Soon, out of the clear sky above the conflict appeared Pele, hurling a fierce bolt of lightning at the giant. It struck the ground at his feet, almost overthrowing him. A second flash of lightning blinded and stunned him. Pai, smitten by this new danger, called for Pu'io, his most mighty ghost god. Pele's fire darts were falling upon him, and he was near death. Then came Pu'io flying down from the steep places of the mountain. Pu'io was a great owl in which, dealt, in which dwelt one of the most powerful of Pai's ancestors. Pu'io hovered over the head of Pai facing Pele. Whenever Pele hurled her fiery darts, the owl swiftly thrust his head from side to side, catching them in his beak, and with a shake of the head, tossing them off to the ground. Then came the warriors in a great body around the giant and his ghost god. Thickly flew their spears and darts. Great clouds of stones were hurled, and both Pai and his owl god were grievously wounded. Pele's flashes of lightning were coming with great rapidity. The giant called to his Aumakua to fly to the mountains. And then, suddenly changing himself into his dragon form, he dashed up the precipice toward his home. The warriors were so surprised at the wonderful change that they forgot to fight and only realized that this dragon was their enemy when they saw him far out of reach of their best weapons. They could see that dragon leaping from stone to stone and swiftly gliding up the steep precipice. He escaped to his home in the mountain recesses and never more troubled the chief by the sea. His employer was killed in a later battle. Pele returned to her home in the volcano of Kilauea. Hawaiian ghost testing. Manoa Valley for centuries has been to the Hawaiians, the royal palace of rainbows. The mountains at the head of the valley were gods whose children were the divine wind and rain from whom was born the beautiful rainbow maiden who plays in and around the valley day and night whenever misty showers are touched by sunlight or moonlight. The natives of the valley usually give her the name of Kahalauapuna or the Hala of Puna. Sometimes, however, they call her Kai Kawahini Anui Nui or the Rainbow Maiden. The rainbow or the Anui Nui marks the continuation of the legendary life of Kahala. The legend of Kahala is worthy of record in itself, but connected with the story is a very interesting account of an attempt to discover and capture ghosts according to the methods supposed to be effective by the Hawaiian witch doctors or priests of the long, long ago. The legends say that the Rainbow Maiden had two lovers, one from Waikiki and one from Kamoa Ili'ili, halfway between Manoa and Waikiki. Both wanted the beautiful arch to rest over their homes and the maiden the descendant of the gods, to dwell therein. Kauhi, the Waikiki chief, was of the family of Moho'ala'i, Moho the shark god, and partook of the shark's cruel nature. He became angry with the rainbow maiden and killed her and buried the body. But her guardian god, Pu'io, the owl scratched away the earth and brought her to life. Several times this occurred, and the owl each time restored the buried body to the wandering spirit. At last, the chief buried the body deep down under the roots of a large koa tree. The owl, goss, the owl god scratched and pulled, but the roots of the tree were many and strong. 
His claws were entangled again and again. At last he concluded that life must be extinct and so deserted the place. The spirit of the murdered girl was wandering around, hoping that it could be restored to the body and not be compelled to descend to Milu, the underworld of the Hawaiians. <clears throat> po was sometimes the underworld, and Milu was the god ruling over Po. The Hawaiian ghosts did not go to the home of the dead as soon as they were separated from the body. Many times, as when rendered unconscious, it was believed that the spirit had left the body, but for some reason had been able to come back into it and enjoy life among friends once more. Kahala, the rainbow maiden, was thus restored several times by the owl god. But with this last failure, it seemed to be certain that the body would grow cold and stiff before the spirit could return. The spirit hastened to and fro in great distress, trying to attract attention. If a wandering spirit could interest someone to render speedy aid, the ancient Hawaiians thought that a human being could place the spirit back in the body. Certain prayers and incantations were very effective in calling the spirit back to its earthly home. The spirit of Kahala was almost discouraged. The shadows of real death were encompassing her, and the feeling of separation from the body was becoming more and more permanent. At last, she saw a noble young chief approaching. He was Mahana, the chief of Kamo'ili'ili. The spirit hovered over him and around him and tried to impress her anguish upon him. Mahana felt the call of distress and attributed it to the presence of a ghost, or Aumakaua, a ghost god. He was conscious of an influence leading him toward a large poetry. There he found the earth disturbed by the owl god. He tore aside the roots and discovered the body bruised and disfigured, and yet recognized it as the body of the rainbow maiden whom he had loved. Mahana's elder brother was a kahuna, or witch doctor, of great celebrity. He was called at once to announce the prayers and invocations necessary for influencing the spirit and the body to reunite. Long and earnestly, the kahuna practiced all the arts with which he was acquainted, and yet completely failed. In his anxiety, he called upon the spirits of two sisters who, as Aumakuas, watched over the welfare of Mahana's clan. These spirit sisters brought the spirit of the rainbow maiden to the bruised body and induced it to enter the feet. Then by using the forces of spirit land, while the kahuna chanted and used his charms, they pushed the spirit of Kahala slowly up to the body until the soul was once more restored to its beautiful tenement. The spirit sisters then aided Mahana in restoring the wounded body to its old vigor and beauty. Thus many days passed in close comradeship between Kahala and the young chief, and they learned to care greatly for one another. But while Kauhi lived, it was unsafe for it to be known that Kahala was alive. Mahana determined to provoke Kauhi to personal combat. Therefore, he sought the places which Kauhi frequented for sport and gambling. Bitter words were spoken and fierce anger aroused until at last, by the skillful use of Kahala's story, Mahana led Kauhi to admit that he had killed the Rainbow Maiden and buried her body. Mahana said that Kahala was now alive and visiting his sisters. Kauhi declared that if there was anyone visiting Mahana's home, it must be an imposter. In his anger against Mahana, he determined a more awful death than could possibly come from any personal conflict. He was so sure that Kahala was dead that he offered to be baked alive in one of the natives' emus or ovens, if she could be produced before the king and the principal chiefs of the district. 
Aka Aka, the grandfather of Kahala, one of the mountain gods of Manoa Valley, was to be one of the judges. This proposition suited Mahana better than a conflict in which there was a possibility of losing his own life. Kauhi now feared that some deception might be practiced. His proposition had been so eagerly accepted that he became suspicious. Therefore, he consulted the sorcerers of his own family. They agreed that it was possible for some powerful kahuna to present the ghost of the murdered maiden and so deceive the judges. They decided that it was necessary to be prepared to test the ghosts. If it could be shown that the ghosts were present, then the aid of spirit catchers from the land of Mailu could be invoked. Spirits would seize these venturesome ghosts and carry them away to the spirit land, where special punishments should be meted out to them. It was supposed, it was supposed that spirit catchers were continually sent out by Mailu, king of the underworld. How could these ghosts be detected? They would certainly appear in human form and be carefully safeguarded. The chief sorcerer of Kaohi's family told Kaohi to make secretly a thorough test. This could be done by taking the large and delicate leaves of the api plant and spreading them over the place where Kahala must walk and sit before the judges. A human being could not touch these leaves so carefully placed without tearing and bruising them. A ghost walking upon them could not make any impression. Untorn leaves would condemn Mahana to the ovens to be baked alive, and the spirit catchers would be called by the sorcerers to seize the escaped ghost and carry it back to spirit land. Of course, if some other maid of the islands had pretended to be Kahala, that could be easily determined by her divine ancestor, Aka Aka. The trial was really a test of ghosts. For the presence of Kahala as a spirit in her human likeness was all that Kauhi and his chief sorcerer feared. The leaves were selected with great care and secretly placed so that no one should touch them but Kahala. There was great interest in this strange contest for a home in a burning oven. The emus had been prepared, the holes had been dug, and the stones and wood necessary for the sacrifice laid close at hand. The king and judges were in their places. The multitude of retainers stood around at a respectful distance. Kauhi and his chief sorcerer were placed where they could watch closely every movement of the maiden who should appear before the judgment seat. Kahala, the rainbow maiden, with all the beauty of her past girlhood restored to her, drew near, attended by the two spirit sisters who had saved and protected her. The spirits knew at once the ghost test by which Kahala was to be tried. They knew also that she had nothing to fear, that they must not be discovered. The test applied to Kahala would only make more evident the proof that she was a living human being, but that same test would prove that they were ghosts. The spirit catchers would be called at once, and they would be caught and carried away for punishment. The spirit sisters could not try to escape. Any such attempt would arouse suspicion, and they would be surely seized. The ghost testing was a serious ordeal for Kahala and her friends. The spirit sisters whispered to Kahala, telling her the purpose attending the use of the ampe leaves and asking her to break as many of them on either side of her as she could without attracting undue attention. Thus, she could aid her own cause and also protect the sister spirits. Slowly and with great dignity, the beautiful rainbow maiden passed through the crowds of eager attendants to their places before the king. Kahala bruised and broke as many of the leaves as she could quietly. She was recognized at once as the child of the divine rain and wind of Manoa Valley. There was no question concerning her bodily presence. 
the torn leaves afforded ample and indisputable testimony. Kaohi, in despair, recognized the girl whom he had several times tried to slay. In bitter disappointment at the failure of his ghost test, the chief sorcerer, as the Kalaukaua version of this legend says, declared that he saw and felt the presence of spirits in some manner connected with her. These spirits, he claimed, must be detected and punished. A second form of ghost testing was proposed by Aka Aka, the mountain god. This was a method frequently employed throughout all the islands of the Hawaiian group. It was believed that any face reflected in a pool or calabash of water was a spirit face. Many times had ghosts been discovered in this way. The face in the water had been grasped by the watcher, crushed between his hands, and the spirit destroyed. The chief sorcerer eagerly ordered a calabash of water to be quickly brought and placed before him. In his anxiety to detect and seize the spirits who might be attending Kahala, he forgot about himself and leaned over the calabash. His own spirit face was the only one reflected on the surface of the water. This spirit face was believed to be his own true spirit, escaping for the moment from the body and bathing in the liquid before him. Before he could leap back and restore his spirit to his body, Aka Aka leaped forward, thrust his hand down into the water, and seized and crushed the spirit face between his mighty hands. Thus it was destroyed before it could return to its home of flesh and blood. The chief sorcerer fell dead by the side of the calabash, by means of which he had hoped to destroy the friends of the Rainbow Maiden. In this trial of the ghosts, the two most powerful methods of making a test as far as known among the ancient Hawaiians, were put in practice. Kaohi was punished for his crimes against Kahala. He was baked alive in the emu prepared on his own land at Waikiki. His lands and retainers were given to Kahala and Mahana. The story of Kahala and her connection with the rainbows and waterfalls of Manoa Valley has been told from time to time in the homes of the nature-loving residents of the valley. A visit to the king of ghosts. When any person lay in an unconscious state, it was supposed by the ancient Hawaiians that death had taken possession of the body and opened the door for the spirit to depart. Sometimes if the body lay like one asleep, the spirit was supposed to return to its old home. One of the Hawaiian legends weaves their deep-rooted faith in the spirit world into the expressions of one who seemed to be permitted to visit that ghost land and its king. This legend belonged to the island of Maui and the region near the village of Lahaina. Thus was the story told. Ka'eliohai, Ka the wild dog, had been sick for days and at last sank into a state of unconsciousness. The spirit of life crept out of the body and finally departed from the left eye into a corner of the house, buzzing like an insect. Then he stopped and looked back over the body he had left. It appeared to him like a massive mountain. The eyes were deep caves into which the ghost looked. Then the spirit became afraid and went outside and rested on the roof of the house. The people began to wail loudly, and the ghost fled from the noise to a coconut tree and perched like a bird in the branches. Soon he felt the impulse of the spirit land moving him away from his old home. He leaped from tree to tree and flew from place to place, wandering toward Kika, the place from which the ghosts leave the island of Maui for their home and the permanent spirit land, the underworld. As he came near this doorway to the spirit world, he met the ghost of a sister who had died long before and to whom was given the power of sometimes turning a ghost back to its body again. She was an Aumakua Ho'ola, 
a spirit making alive. She called to Ka Elio Hai and told him to come to her house and dwell for a time. But she warned him that when her husband was at home, he must not yield to any invitation from him to enter their house, nor could he partake of any of the food which her husband might urge him to eat. The home and the food would be only the shadows of real things and would destroy his power of becoming alive again. The sister said, when my husband comes to eat the food of the spirits and to sleep the sleep of ghosts, then I will go with you and you shall see all the spirit land of our island and see the king of ghosts. The ghost sister led Ka Elio Hai into the place of whirlwinds, a hill where he heard the voices of many spirits planning to enjoy all the sports of their former life. He listened with delight and drew near to the multitude of happy spirits. Some were making ready to go down to the sea for the Hi Nalu surf riding. Others were already rolling the Ulu Maika, the round stone discs for rolling along the ground. Some were engaged in the Mokomolo or Umau Uma boxing and the Kalu Kalai wrestling, as well as the Hanu Hanu pulling with the hands, the Lulu pulling with hooked fingers and other athletic sports. Some of the spirits were already grouped in the shade of trees, playing the gambling games in which they had delighted when alive. There were the stone Konani board, somewhat like checkers, the Pui Pui one, Pui Pui Oni, a small sand mound in which was concealed some object, the Puhini Hini, the hidden stone under piles of kappa, and the many other trials of skill which permitted betting. Then in another place, crowds were gathered around the hulas, the many forms of dancing. These sports were all in the open air and seemed to be full of interest. There was a strange quality which fettered every newborn ghost. He could only go in the direction into which he was pushed by the hand of some stranger power. If the guardian of a ghost struck it on one side, it would move off in the direction indicated by the blow or the push until spirit strength and experience came and he could go alone. The newcomer desired to join in these games and started to go, but the sister slapped him on the breast and drove him away. These were shadow games into which those who entered could never go back to the substantial things of life. Then there was a large grass house inside which many ghosts were making merry. The visitor wanted to join this great company, but the sister knew that if he once was engulfed by this crowd of spirits in this shadow land, her brother could never escape. The crowds of players would seize him like a whirlwind, and he would be unable to know the way he came in or the way out. Kailio Hai tried to slip away from his sister, but he could not turn readily. He was still a very awkward ghost, and his sister slapped him back in the way she wanted him to go. An island which was supposed to float on the ocean as one of the homes of the Aumakoas, the ghosts of the ancestors, had the same characteristics. The ghosts lived on the shadows of all that belonged to the earth life. It was said that a canoe with a party of young people landed on this island of dreams and for some time enjoyed the food and fruits and sports, but after returning to their homes could not receive the nourishment of the food of their former lives and soon died. The legends taught that no ghost passing out the body could return unless it made the life of the Aumakua Kapu to itself. Soon, the sister led her brother to a great field, stonewalled, in which were such fine grass houses as were built only for chiefs of the highest rank. There she pointed to a narrow passageway into which she told her brother he must enter by himself. This, she said, is the home of Walia, 
the high chief of the ghosts living in this place. You must go to him. Listen to all he says to you. Say little. Return quickly. There will be three watchmen guarding this passage. The first will ask you, what is the fruit desire of your heart? You will answer, Walia. Then he will let you enter the passage. Inside the walls of the narrow way will be the second watchman. He will ask why you come. Again, answer Walia and pass by him. At the end of the entrance, the third guardian stands holding a raised spear ready to strike. Call to him, Kamaki Loa, the great death. This is the name of his spear. Then he will ask what you want, and you must reply, to see the chief, and he will let you pass. Then again, when you stand at the door of the great house, you will see two heads bending together in the way so that you cannot enter or see the king and his queen. If these heads can catch a spirit coming to see the king without knowing the proper incantations, they will throw that ghost into the pomilu, the dark spirit world. Watch, therefore, and remember all that is told you. When you see these heads, point your hands straight before you between them and open your arms, pushing these guards off on each side. Then the Ala Nui, the great way, will be open for you, and you can enter. You will see Kahili's soft, long feather fans moving over the cheeks. The king will awake and call. Why does this traveler come? You will reply quickly. He comes to see the divine one. When this is said, no injury will come to you. Listen and remember, and you will be alive again. Kaileo Hai did as he was told with the three watchmen, and each one stepped back saying, Noah, the taboo is lifted, and he pushed by. At the door, he shoved the two heads to the side and entered the chief's house to the Ka Ikuwai, the middle, falling on his hands and knees. The servants were waving the Kahilis this way and that. There was motion, but no noise. The chief awoke, looked at Ka Iliohai, and said, Aloha, stranger, come near. Who is the high chief of your land? Then Kailio Hai gave the name of his king and the genealogy from the ancient times of the chiefs dead and in the spirit world. The queen of ghosts arose and the kneeling spirit saw one more beautiful than any woman in all the island and he fell on his face before her. The king told him to go back and enter his body and tell his people about troubles near at hand. While he was before the king, twice he heard messengers call to the people that the sports were all over. Anyone not heeding would be thrown into the darkest place of the home of the ghosts when the third call had been sounded. The sister was troubled, for she knew that at the third call, the stone walls around the king's houses would close and her brother would be held fast forever in the spirit land. She uttered her incantations and passed the guard Softly, she called. Her brother reluctantly came. She seized him and pushed him outside. Then they heard the third call and met the multitude of ghosts coming inland from their sports in the sea and other multitudes hastening homeward from their work and sports on the land. They met a beautiful young woman who called to them to come to her home and pointed to a point of rock where many birds were resting. The sister struck her brother and forced him down to the seaside where she had her home and her responsibility, for she was one of the guardians of the entrance to the spirit world. She knew well what must be done to restore the spirit to the body. She told her brother they must at once obey the command of the king, but the brother had seen the delights of the life of the Amukoas and wanted to stay. He tried to slip away and hide. But his sister held him fast and compelled him to go along the beach to his old home and his waiting body. When they came to the place where the body lay, she found a hole in the corner of the house and pushed the spirit through. When he saw the body, 
he was very much afraid and trying to escape. But the sister caught him and pushed him inside the foot up to the knee. He did not like the smell of the body and tried to rush back. But she pushed him inside again and held the foot fast and shook him and made him go to the head. The family heard a little sound in the mouth and saw breath moving the breast. Then they knew that he was alive again. They warmed the body and gave a little food. When strength returned, he told his family all about his wonderful journey into the land of ghosts.